that uh, this disease is ended and you are uh, going to join us in our town in Basra in the next meeting, not like this one online. Uh, we prepare uh, a lecture which is about our message to improve our learning in the future uh, because we don't know what's going to happen within the next year. We uh, prepare ourselves that the same situation will be uh, that uh, students will not attend the campus and we will depend on uh, not e-learning alone but uh, uh, we depend on something else especially in the medical uh, schools uh, both teaching and learning methods must be restricted for the students to improve their grades and have a bright academic future and this is what we mean by uh, embracing the point of uh, the clinical part of the learning. Undergraduates are no longer engaged in a class because their attention is repurposed online. Uh, everything is online, not only teaching uh, because of this era. So they don't pay attention because teachers often focus too much on the theoretical part of a class. We as teachers should move from the traditional methods to new ones taking in consideration the internet-minded students with the new technologies and coexisting COVID-19 pandemic, as we mentioned, which prevent the students from joining us in the physical or uh, actual classes. It was a challenging decision to choose the type of learning to meet the requirements with a better outcome of stakeholders uh, that our graduates should be able to use their abilities and uh, skills uh, to join the, uh, their future in the uh, hospitals, uh, clinics, and so forth. If they want to travel abroad, to study outside, to complete their higher educations, and so forth. Uh, to have a summary of uh, what we have done, uh, as a questionnaire for our students about e-learning and its technologies, uh, we start from this uh, white uh, part of the chart. This is the only number of our students to start with 29%. Uh, they are eager or want to learn with electronic learning, while the majority, 71%, uh, the yellow one, is uh, not uh, accepting the electronic learning, but we have no choice. If we didn't do that, we will lose the uh, year. And uh, successfully, thanks for God and everyone who helped us, we completed the previous year and our students are doing well and we will try to uh, prepare them with some clinical skills that is lost during the last year. And uh, the same thing for the other charts or questionnaire, if uh, you can see, most of the students, uh, this is the whitish one is the acceptance and the other one is the uh, refusal or the abilities. If you have any ability to deal with e-learning, most of the students, 75% have no uh, abilities to deal with it because of their previous dependence on the physical learning. And uh, about the e-learning and its technologies, and we ask our students still they are uh, not accepting that. And the last one, the last part of the chart, showing that 73% expecting that the electronic learning in Basra University will face a lot of difficulties and problems. As you know, we have the difficulties in internet and its uh, speed. We have the difficulties in electricity. We have difficulties in uh, the economic situation of our students to have all these expensive technologies for learning. So still we are uh, doing a negotiation with the students in order to uh, prepare them for the electronic learning and uh, uh, to have their equipment with them by doing our best with all our uh, colleagues to supply them with the uh, 
laptops or uh, iPads or mobiles and internet lines to complete their e-learning. And this is uh, the slide which we again have the idea of the students about they have any sufficient information about e-learning. As you can see, 18% only have this part of teaching because we have uh, one of the colleges, which is Al-Zahra Medical College, is dependent on the uh, integrated learning. So their uh, teaching is, from the start, is depending on e-learning and physical uh, learning. So 18% of our students are uh, having sufficient information about the e-learning to start with, I mean, in the previous year. And these are the most important uh, calls they can use or they can depend on. Uh, as you can see, the free conference call is uh, used uh, very little, about 5% only, which while the PDF type of uh, learning or lectures was very uh, widely or diffused used by the teachers and the students because it is easy to start with. But late, later on, and the other uh, one is the telegram, because again, this is preferred by the students. So we want to go with them, with their uh, line. We don't want to lose the students. We go with the uh, call or the conference call, and uh, we leave it, and we go with the WhatsApp and the PDF and the telegram, because they usually attending at that uh, stages and uh, we use them uh, to learn in these, uh, these uh, uh, charts and then we change to our uh, type of learning which is uh, will be will, we will tell you about it in the next lectures again about our teachers uh, we have their questionnaire about their uh, their expenses in the next year, what will they will expect in the next year that the uh, optimum type of learning. And as you can see, 71% of our teachers recommend the hybrid type of uh, learning. 29% uh, they don't accept this type of learning, still they are insisting on the physical attendance of the lectures we have for the future there are many types of learning which can help us in the uh, in the medical type the medical learning and especially for the clinical aspect of learning which is important in the sixth year fifth and sixth year uh, to join the uh, hospitals and to have their experience with the work and the most accepted one is the blended learning, which is going to combine the electronic learning for the theoretical aspect and two days per week attendance for small groups from 15 to 20 students in, in the college or the hospital with the uh, safety equipment, with the mask and uh, all of these uh, uh, equipment to prevent uh, social distance and so forth to prevent the cross infection or contact with each other. So blended learning is the one we, which we choose in the future or in the next year, inshallah. Blended learning is also often called hybrid learning or mixed mode of learning. It is a mixture between the traditional teaching in a class and the learning, as we mentioned, with small groups. And the students learned about the topic and the theory at home. So there is more time for the teacher to do their exercises and to do uh, the clinical aspect later on. And the message is to improve teaching skills and technologies is to improve the students. We are doing our best to improve our uh, teachers' skills in the electronic learning and uh, to have our uh, labs equipped with the minimum uh, attendance of the students to prevent cross infection and thank you very much thank you very much professor saad hamadi asma'a
Thank you very much, Professor Saad Hamadi, the Chancellor of Basra University, for this uh, nice and valuable presentation. And uh, now we will go to our next guest speaker, uh, Professor Isabel from Malta. You hear me, Professor? I certainly can. Thank you so much. Thank you. I Thank you for joining us today. Not at all. I'm very, very, very pleased to meet you all. And I hope you can all hear me. I will um, uh, share my screen, if I, if I may, and um, begin this uh, presentation by... Yeah, just, uh, yes. Okay, Professor. Just I want to introduce you to the, to, to the to attendees. Okay? Yes. Give me one please minute, please, and then start your presentation. Professor uh, Isabel, uh, she is a gynecologist from Malta, teaches anatomy at the uh, Faculty of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Malta, and she is uh, currently director of the International School for Foundation Studies and Medical Foundation Program, and her main research interests are in medical education. Uh, her teaching and research experience have led to invitation to serve as a referee. Uh, Referee for major journals. And uh, sorry, uh, there is something with the uh, wrong with the net. And uh, uh, she is uh, the author of about uh, of over 60 publications in the peer reviewed literature. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Isabel, again, and then you can start your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I hope you can be happy to meet you all, of course, and, and we can continue our conversation through the, through the chat afterwards. Um, we've divided up this talk uh, so that my colleagues that will come after me will talk specifically about clinical education, although I will, I will touch upon this a little bit. But I would like to um, focus primarily on um, uh, the preclinical world. So um, I'll start with a few pretty pictures of where I come from um, and, and ask you, you know, to, to think about this. You know, why, why, why should we get in front of a class to tell them something that they can read? Okay, I think that there is a great deal of information out there in the literature, in books, in videos, um, uh, in all sorts of um, technological options. So why do we really need to physically be there in front of the class? Before we go much further, I'd like to have uh, explain a couple of definitions so that we are all clear on this. This has already been talked about uh, in, in, our, um, uh, in the gracious introduction that we received. So the traditional approach, of course, is a face-to-face -face approach. The blended approach is one where we combine the face-to-face -face approach when absolutely necessary, and that is the key, when is it absolutely necessary, together with electricity. Um, teaching of some sort, and we will talk about what those options might be. Two more terms I'd like to bring in. One is the word synchronous, which means that if we are um, uh, talking about online teaching and learning, then it is uh, live. In other words, I have the students in front of me on Zoom or on Teams or on any other video platform. The other option is asynchronous learning, which is where students are provided with links, they're provided with tasks, they're provided with um, um, videos to, to watch and respond to, and they learn through uh, self-paced learning uh, that takes, takes them however long it's going to take. Today I will talk about three main areas, um, uh, teaching of course, learning, and, um, uh, and assessment. So the, the first thing I did when I went started looking at this was to see, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I've got a bit of white hair here, so I've been around a little while, and I wonder how long this has been around. And in fact, computer-assisted learning, which was the old terminology for e-learning, um, has been around for quite a long time. I found one paper here um, referring to teaching and dentistry, but obviously it applies to medicine, um, going back to 1981. Um, that was the year I graduated as a medical doctor. 
So um, this, this uh, quote here from, from this gentleman, uh, computer assisted learning should not replace traditional education, but be used as a supplement for self-directed studies. Well, 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 absolutely right. Let us also not forget that the students in front of us are not children. They are adults for the most part. Most of them are over 18. Most of them are therefore able to distinguish between what is important and what is not. Sometimes they have difficulties and that's why we're here, but um, adults want to learn experimentally. They want to problem solve. They want to handle things themselves. And they learn best when whatever it is we're teaching them has immediate value. Of course, that is, um, uh, that's, uh, that's the ideal situation. On the right hand side, you see your average student going, oh my God, oh my God, how am I going to cope with um, all this information? So what are the, the two main constraints that I think we have currently, not only in preclinical, but also in clinical education? One is time because the curriculum is absolutely jam-packed. So there's no time to actually deal with topics that we want to add. And the second, of course, is COVID, um, which has caused a, a great deal of consternation here. But medical students, dental students, or all kind of health uh, sciences students are um, adults, and I think they are open to new methods of learning. And it is our role, I believe, it is our responsibility to encourage these students to become active learners rather than passive learners, which most of them are. Okay, our role is also, or challenge in, in, in fact, is to adopt these new teaching methods while maintaining the excellence that we know um, we, we, we can achieve. So essentially it's about going from the sage on the stage, which is where most of us are, right? We stand in front of students and we speak as though we know it all, to being someone who is more by the side of the students, with the, the, the technical term here is guide by the side, and instead of lecturing all the time, we are in fact facilitating their learning. We are facilitators of learning. This of course requires us to have, um, to have mastered the use of uh, technology. And this is where some of us uh, you know, fall short. And we also have to have learned and realized what are the not only advantages, but also disadvantages of the technology that we are using. Um, as an aside, uh, you should probably, you're probably aware that originally e-learning was promoted um, in order to save costs um, and increase efficiency, right? You can have lots of students all doing the same thing all the time. You don't need to be physically be, be with them um, uh, while they're doing this. This has already been alluded to, and I, I really must emphasize this. It is so, so important. This is the so-called learning pyramid adapted from um, uh, uh, a publication that's at least 30 years old. So um, I, this is where we mostly are. We normally lecture to students, right? And in fact, when we think about lecturing to students, this is how much of the information they retain. Very, very little. Not more than 5%, 10% or whatever. Clearly, as you go down the, the learning pyramid or, or you know, go down towards the bottom, reading, they return, retain a little bit more. Any audiovisual tools where they're actually watching a video or interacting with a video, they're learning and retaining a little bit more. And the further down you go the pyramid, the further down the pyramid you go, excuse my English, the, the, the greater the retention of knowledge. And look at where we are at the very bottom, teaching others. So once students are forced, because we have to force them to teach each other through what's called peer teaching and peer learning, that is when they really and truly retain material. Um, I don't have to tell you, um, it's very difficult to actually teach something that you don't know. I, I'm sure you've tried it. I've tried it, you know, say, oh yeah, I'll give a lecture on so-and-so because someone um, can't take it. Yeah, I'll take over, no problem. But actually, if I don't know the subject very well, it's not a very good lecture. Right, so um, let's moving on. Uh, one possible blended learning approach, one that we have chosen at our university. Um, it's a, a series of, of steps. Um, and of course, this is not written in stone. We chose this because it makes sense for us, but of course it may not make sense for you. First of all, we need the students to acquire basic knowledge. Now, how can they do this? Yes, they need to attend relevant lectures, emphasis on the relevant. It is not necessary to lecture students about material that they can read in the books. What they need are lectures on material that is difficult. 
difficult. If you're talking anatomy, for example, I don't need to tell you um, about how, you know, what the attachments of this muscle and that muscle are. You can get that in the books. You can watch a video. But if I'm trying to explain the um, uh, orientation of the pterico-palatine fossa, um, which is really quite complicated, then that might be a good idea for me to lecture, to, you know, to give you a lecture or to explain. So anyway, attending relevant lectures, followed by obviously using textbooks and other self-directed learning modules, but it's not enough. The next step is um, to give them some cases, some clinically relevant cases to whatever it is they're learning, whether it's the relevant anatomy, the physiology, the pathology, microbiology, some cases. I'm not talking about problem-based learning here. I'm talking about case-based learning. And then on a weekly basis, on a weekly basis, they will have um, interactive discussions, again, online, because it, it is quite, um, um, it's quite fine to, to do this online. Hold on, let me turn on the fan because it's getting hot here. Um, uh, online, followed by dissection sessions for anatomy, and of course the equivalent in physiology or pathology, hands-on sessions, let's call that, where students uh, rotate around um, uh, various stations. Here, of course, we need to bear in mind the COVID restrictions. So in, in, in our university, we have um, put students in very small bubbles of four. Um, they obviously have to wear protection and they have to stay in the very same bubbles for the whole of the academic year. Um, and then finally, they will practice uh, relevant clinical skills um, on each other. So that's one possible uh, blended learning approach. Let's not forget that there are so many um, educational tools out there for self-paced learning. Many of them are free. Um, and what we know is that students, in fact, really love them. They love to play with these tools. Um, uh, they can, of course, be, be, they can use them at any time, at any place. Um, they can also be used interactively. So one student or group of students with each other. And the beauty of them is that they can address the different types of learning need, learning styles that, that students have. You know, some students are visual learners, some are mostly audi auditory learners, but most students are kinesthetic learners. They like to do things, and when they do things, they're more likely to remember. The issue of a flipped classroom was brought up, and I think this is extremely important for those of you who don't know what that is very briefly. What this means is that the material is provided beforehand, students have the opportunity to learn, to read, to learn, to understand. And then when they come to the class, that class session, whether it's a face-to-face -face class or, a um, um, a uh, or online, that time is spent problem solving. Either the tutor answering questions of students who have not understood or the other way around, the students um, being asked questions by the tutor to make sure they have understood. So other advantages of uh, this, um, uh, these these e-learning tools, um, many of them also have a self-assessment components, so they can answer questions as they go along, which means they know, in fact, whether they've learned this or not. There's no doubt that these tools are particularly suited to subjects that are um, difficult to conceptualize, for example, complex biochemical processes, microscopical images, or, of course, gross anatomy. Um, not, not every aspect of clinical, of, of medical teaching is, in fact, suitable for this type of e-learning approach. The other advantage, um, and I don't have to tell you, is that students can do this at their own pace, which means that it's particularly useful for the weaker student, the student who is, in fact, struggling to, cap to um, capture all the, all the materials. Now, there are obviously some basic requirements. You, you do need to have an electronic management system. And uh, the one that was introduced to us a couple of weeks ago um, in Tehran was really quite amazing uh, because it allowed uh, all sorts of interactions between the participants and, and uh, the tutors. So the option of video conferencing, discussion boards, email, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly, you also need training. Both students and the teaching staff need to be trained how to use this. Fairly simple, but they need training. And, and this is really the most important thing, really, um, senior management, um, the major, you know, the senior administrators need to engage with this and agree that it is a good idea. There are some disadvantages, and you've already mentioned some of them in the introduction. Of course, there are um, uh, internet issues, bandwidth especially. 
it is extremely time consuming for tutors to engage in online discussions with students, especially in small groups. It's very easy to enter a discussion board and write an email or respond to all students at once. But if you want the students to be working in small groups and you want each of those small groups to be independent of each other, so they're not copying, right? They are learning independently within a small group. You actually need to respond to each of those groups, which can take a great deal of time. It is a major disadvantage. Um, Yes, it does require a cultural change in, in learning practice. It's not easy for everyone. And as I said, there may be some administrative um, obstacles. I will mention them later. There is the issue of copyright as well. Um, uh, there needs to be a, an agreed pol policy by the, by the university on intellectual property rights. Who owns this material? Do I own it? Does, is it owned by the university? Who can disseminate this? And, and who can, in fact, spread it outside um, the university um, uh, environment. One last disadvantage, I don't have to tell you this, it can be frustrating, it can be time consuming. You click here, you click there, and things don't, don't happen. Just this morning, I, I, I was uh, giving a lecture, I was supposed to give a, a lecture at nine o'clock. I couldn't enter the Zoom room because the secretary had disabled hosting rights and, and I just couldn't get in. So she had to transfer the hosting. You know, these are small things but they, are, they get in the way of, um, uh, of, of progress. So I think that um, technological uh, innovations, as you, as you know, they're welcome to students. Students love them, okay? This is the digital generation, but, and I think um, most of you would probably agree with me that they cannot entirely replace, entirely replace hands-on sessions or lectures, but perhaps replace some of them. So, there are, some, there are some challenges here. We, we need, um, we need to, to create new ways of work within our respective institutions, especially if they are resistant to change. I hope yours are not. Mine has been a little bit resistant, but we're getting there slowly. Um, these, this resistance comes from a, number of, um, uh, from a number of places. Some of it is fear, fear of the unknown. Some of it is due to their under, underlying values. They have different values than, than yours. They have different ways of thinking. They have different uh, management styles. But essentially, and this is um, uh, the, 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 the key on this slide, is how do we make it happen? Well, first of all, we need to create that readiness for change. And that comes from seminars like this, where people like yourselves and myself um, learn how that it is in fact possible and move that message along. So energizing the commitment within your own faculties, within your own universities. It helps sometimes to obtain political support, here political with a small p, not politics outside, but politics within the university. Of course, you or someone needs to manage that transition from complete face-to-face -to, -face to blended learning, and it will probably fall on your shoulders, the shoulders of the people who are mostly um, committed to this. And after that, you also have to sustain the momentum, keep it going, you know, week after week, month after month. From the student's point of view, and I do want to mention this because it's really quite important. Um, after all, we are here for our students. There is a great deal of anxiety and uncertainty in, in the minds of students. There's issue of per personal safety. There are issues of continuity of learning. They are fearful and understanding of, you know, they under we understand how they feel. And then there are two other um, issues I want to bring up. One is that some students lose themselves in this virtual environment. They literally, you don't see them anymore. They switch off, you lose them. Others on the other hand, find themselves. They are the ones who actually realize that, you know, they are where they are and they are doing a right, the right thing, they're learning. Some people, some students will perceive that uh, virtual seminar group, if they're in a small group, as a warm, friendly, supportive place, a place where they can uh, share. Others, especially females, I must say, um, will perceive themselves as facing a whole sea of strangers and they are extremely unhappy in this environment. So we need to be aware of what students, um, uh, how students feel about this. I won't spend too much time on this, but basically there are stages of competence in, in online learning from level one to level five. And it's the level five students that we want, one who takes responsibility for their own learning, is able to set up and support their own virtual group. I, I will of course be sharing all these slides with you. So don't, don't worry, you'll be able to read these at your, at your leisure. 
So in terms of process, in terms of the curriculum process, um, I think it's important that we decide, you decide beforehand, at the very beginning, which part of the curriculum are we going to deliver face-to-face -face and which part are we going to ask use e-learning for. And there is a, a very delicate balance here, which will vary from location to location. It will, we need to consider the learning outcomes of that particular um, uh, unit that you are teaching. We have to consider the level of the student, of course, the electronic resources, as you said before, um, and the students' abilities, their own computer skills. One of the things that we learned um, uh, through the pandemic uh, lockdown in March, April, and May was that um, asking students to type their answers meant that it took them much, much longer to answer questions. Many students don't type, they use a phone. They, they, you know, they use their thumbs to, to um, you know, manipulate a phone, but they're not used to, on, to, to typing on the screen. Okay, um, yes, we need to invest in staff development, okay? This cannot happen uh, on its own and it cannot happen only with you. You are essentially the people who will need to then train other people to do this. It helps to create uh, a central resource base. There is no point in everybody reinventing the wheel here. Um, I have materials that I have prepared and I'm more than happy to share them with you. Equally, I'm sure there are many of you out there who have materials, we need to share them because that is the, the, the quickest way to be up and running. Once we have created these materials, we can integrate them with the traditional um, learning, um, uh, the learning processes. One last thing, which I think is really important is we need to incentivize because staff who become, as I put it here, active members of this virtual campus, right? The student, the, the staff who are really putting in all this effort should be compensated for in some way because it does take a lot more time than simply standing in front of a, a class and giving a, a lecture. So um, uh, we should consider, you know, including this um, uh, as, a, as a maybe, you know, one of the criteria for, for promotion, which we all, we all would like to have. So um, practical issues now, logistics issues, if I may. Um, this is what we've decided to do, basically. Um, lectures and critical thinking sessions, which is where we ask students to work on cases, are live, Zoomed, and recorded. So um, no face-to-face -face teaching here, all online, but it is in, uh, recorded on, on Zoom so they can listen to it again. For practical sessions, whether they are dissections or clinical skills sessions, students in small bubbles and the same small bubbles. Timetable organized in such a way that each uh, small group of students only needs to come on campus very few times a week, um, preferably only once, to minimize the number of people who are actually entering and exiting the university. Spacing in corridors, making sure that they do stay two meters apart, very difficult, but we need to do that. Um, issues like, you know, don't bring a whole bunch of stuff with you, you know, keep your computer at home, leave your book at home, just come um, uh, and interact with us on that day. There, I'm sure many countries have introduced a, a contact uh, tracing app, we certainly have, keep it running so that if we do have a positive case, then we can, um, uh, then we can contact trace very quickly. In terms of assessment, and I will come to that um, uh, now, um, what are some of the challenges of, of online, online assessment? And then I don't have to tell you this, you have all been through these problems yourselves last May and June. So some of the, um, some of the issues, first of all, flexibility. Um, I think uh, it, it, it's been said that ideally we should you know, stick to MCQs and, and true false questions because these can be e corrected. I disagree. Um, I, I don't think we should be sticking only to those forms of assessment. Of course, we should use them, but I think we can, in fact, use short answer questions with some case studies. And what you do then is you ask the students to scan the answers and email them to you with, um, with free software. Yes, of course, you cannot completely eliminate cheating, but there is another um, possible solution for that. Clearly, students have to be given um, the opportunity to practice, either through formative assessment and reflection, and certainly uh, preliminary testing, you know, um, testing the system before they actually take the exam. 
There are technical issues. I don't have to tell you what they are. Um, uh, uh, there, is, there is that issue, and, and that is one, a very practical one that we would need to consider. I would like to talk a little bit about student stress, because remember, uh, the whole point of an assessment is to find out what the student knows, not what they don't know. We want to know what they know. And once they are stressed, extremely stressed by the exam, especially if their slow typing speed is getting in the way with their time management, then they become even more stressed. Um, the students need to trust us and the exam. And that means that trust, that trust must be earned. We must earn their trust by working with them before the exam to convince them that we will be safe. Um, sorry, that they will be safe. Um, how to minimize cheating. Uh, you've all got your own ideas, and I'm sure some of these things are, are already uh, things you're doing. But for me, number one is not, um, uh, is not the stick, but the carrot, okay? If we ask questions that are, and I will give you some examples in a moment, um, that are higher bloom taxonomy questions, you cannot. It's, it's far, far, far less easy to cheat there. Okay, I'll give you some examples. If you are going to use multiple choice questions, then yes, you can have multiple sets of questions at the same level of difficulty, which you, which you randomly um, uh, send to, to, to students. You can shuffle questions, of course, so they can't help each other. You know, what's the answer to question number two? Um, you can and probably should, with multiple choice questions, significantly limit the exam time because otherwise they will help each other out. You can supervise them during the exam. Of course, that depends on how many students you have, and it does require many proctors. So the, the, the more students you have taking the exam, if you're going to supervise them, you really need a lot of us watching. Yes, you should really and truly be asking open book questions. You should be asking analytic questions. Um, if you can't do any of this, then there, are, there is software that um, locks down the browser so they cannot cheat, as in they cannot look things up on Google on the computer that they're currently using, but they all have one of these. And clearly they can use the phone at the same time, okay? You can um, uh, use Turnitin if you're checking for plagiarism. Uh, and what we have also done, and we think it's really very useful, is we tell the students ahead of time that they may be asked to have an oral exam randomly. And in that case, we will know whether they have in fact um, um, learned the material or not. Um, quick point about Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy. I'm using an example here of, of anatomical assessment, but the same thing applies to any question you'd like. Um, Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy, remembering. Remembering is the lowest level of, of knowing, if you like. So the, the question where I want to test their um, memory would be, um, give me the attachment of this or the other structure. Understanding, the second level. Explain to me in anatomical terms why sensation over the palm of the hand is intact um, if you have a carpal tunnel syndrome. So this requires understanding and explanation. Next level, even higher, applying. Now, what questions can you ask your, um, your patient to distinguish between a median nerve injury at the elbow and at the wrist? There is a difference. What questions can you ask your patient to find which of these two they have? Another level, even more difficult. But this is what we really want them to know. In what ways does the claw hand of a median nerve and ulnar nerve injury differ? How do they differ? How do you know that one is, one is different to the other? What are the consequences of a fracture of the neck of the humerus? You know, what, you know, what could happen rather than answering this nerve passes here, this artery does this, what are the consequences of? And then lastly, the most difficult, I suppose, is what tools can you use, could you use to evaluate the severity of a, a brachial plexus injury? Now, I'm not suggesting that every single topic be addressed in all these methods. I'm simply saying, please, let us not only test memory, because that is not real learning. Um, uh, I think you've already mentioned, we've already mentioned most of this, and I realize that my, my time is running up, so I, I will quickly pass this on. But basically, uh, very quickly, we must have pilot exams. Students need to know what they are likely to um, uh, uh, come across. Ideally, if, you, if you're going to use uh, some software to run the exam, there is some that actually allows cloud backup, so that if the, the, the student's exam is interrupted, 
they don't lose everything. Everything is still there and uploaded to, to, to the cloud. At the end, my conclusion, if I may. Um, blended learning, I think, really transforms the role of the teacher. We are no longer the disseminator of knowledge. We are no longer the sage on the stage. We are facilitators of learning. Blended learning allows collaborative work learning and collaborative learning leads to better doctors. These are better communicators, better able to express themselves. The, the teaching and learning is flexible. Um, it's, it's centered on the student and it overcomes the restrictions of time and space that we currently have. There is no doubt that we can um, achieve much more than we can just using textbooks um, without, frankly, increasing um, our resources. Clearly, it's convenient. Clearly, it's very flexible. And there are no geographic constraints. You are sitting in, in, in Iraq and Iran. And I'm sitting in Malta right now. And um, I will tell you that in my classroom at the moment in the foundation school, because I run a pre-tertiary program as well, um, I ha currently have 37 students in 17 countries and they are all logging in and learning together. Um, one other thing that I think is really important is what does the student learn from this? They, what do they gain apart from gaining knowledge? And um, uh, what else do they gain? Well, they gain persistence, things you know, if things fail, they have to persist until it works. They learn to be adaptable. They learn to be resilient. And of course, they learn to be tolerant of uncertainty, which is, after all, one of the great, uh, one of the most important features of, of medical practice, uncertainty. So lastly, I, um, I, this is my opinion. And you can absolutely disagree with me, and then that's perfectly fine. But I think the medical school of the future, not the current medical school, but the medical school of the future is one where probably in collaboration with each other, we offer a flexible menu of face-to-face -face and self-study modules. It isn't necessary for me to teach only my students. I can teach your students and you can do exactly the same. So individual students can select I will take this module from this university because it actually is a good module. I'll take this module from another university. Frankly, I believe that any other option, including staying where we are right now, will probably be unaffordable in the future. So I will end there and um, um, with one of my favorite places to swim <laughs> and uh, see if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Isabel. Really, uh, it was uh, very interesting and uh, very nice presentation. Uh, thanks for sharing us with uh, your information. Uh, uh, it was so fast, uh, yes. it was so fast, uh, but uh, it is very interesting information. And uh, we will open the uh, Q and A session uh, at the end of the lectures. Okay, uh, attendees. Okay. Uh, we will open a Q&A session, uh, or you can type your question in the chat, please. Thank you again, Professor Isabel. Now Thank we will go. Now we will go to our next speaker from Iran, Dr. Rita. Dr. Rita. Uh, Hello, share. everybody. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm sharing everything. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Rita. Uh, Mushtaba Zada from Iran, from the Department of E-Learning and Medical Education, Virtual School, Tehran University of Medical Sciences. And uh, she has a PhD in E-Learning Planning. She is a co-founder of Virtual School of Tehran University of Medical Sciences and uh, a, member, uh, a faculty member of E-Learning and Medical Education Department and Vice Dean for international affairs in this school. And uh, she is a dual affiliated faculty, uh, faculty member of medical education uh, department and virtual university of medical sciences. Uh, uh, she has been one of the principal investigators of several research projects in the field of e-learning and medical education in Iran. Some are as fellow academic uh, ranking of the uh, medical schools, metric systems of uh, faculties, members, activities, and uh, comprehensive education, our system, comprehensive system, 
of a continuous education, national and institutional accreditation system of e-learning centers and so on. Uh, now, uh, she, uh, as the uh, core responsible body, is working on the development and establishment of Iran's national massive open online courses, MOOCs platform, and national learning management system, LMS. Uh, she has published several uh, articles and books in related fields. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Rita, for joining us. You can start your presentation. Uh, okay, hello everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. I should uh, thank Prof. Shaheen, Prof. Iftikhar, and you all colleagues in Basra University. And also I, I would uh, send my hellos to dear Prof. Isabel. Nice to meet you here again. Uh, I really love your lectures. I learn a lot whenever you uh, have a presentation. And also, I, I'm deeply grateful because of the, uh, in regards of your feedback uh, toward the, uh, our experience in Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Let me start my presentation. I'm going to uh, start my uh, lecture. Uh, actually a brief one um, that is about blended learning in clinical education. Okay, uh, let's start the presentation with the, going through the history of blended learning. You know that uh, whenever we talk about blended learning, mostly we are talking of mixing or combining online learning with face-to-face -face learning. Uh, that was what we thought of blended learning. But when Corona uh, came, uh, and we were happy with this idea, I know that most of professors used in some extent, in some extent virtual learning in their traditional uh, teaching learning process. And um, it, it didn't matter if it is a clinical education or a non-clinical one. The minimum level was using social media as a complementary tool for uh, their teaching learning process uh, classes. But um, when the corona came, we were shocked because of the closure of the universities, this face-to-face -face, uh, part of teaching learning was gone. And it was suddenly gone as a shock. And now, we know that we are not happy with this. And we are trying all over the world to find solutions to overcome this barrier. Let's see what happened. Uh, we thought a lot all over the world, the teachers, educators, medical educationists, they, they all uh, put a lot of effort. And at the end, they reached to uh, a new approach that is, um, you know, uh, applying a new definition of blended learning in teaching learning process. And that is a mix of learning online through different learning strategies. That is omitting face-to-face -face inter interaction. So it worked uh, and it is working for many courses in our curricula, uh, especially the ones that don't need uh, psychomotor skills. And, but what happens about clinical education? Can we omit face-to-face -face part? Absolutely, your answer is no. We cannot omit the face-to-face -face part. We need it to some extent. So a question raises, what is the solution? What can we do? Uh, let's take a look at our uh, clinical education activities and must to knows. You know that when uh, students, medical students, dental students, they come to school, they need some theoretical knowledge as the background of uh, acquiring skills. There are some activities run in our wards, running our wards, uh, like morning reports, case presentation, clinical runs, and so on. They need to learn communication skills, history taking, physical examination. They need to perform different clinical procedures. They should be able to provide consultation to our patients. And also I know that depending on the discipline, there are so many other duties, tasks, and activities that are assigned to our uh, learners. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm focusing on this point that how can we design uh, our course, our education in a clinical world to, uh, you know, cover all these aspects of our teaching learning process. Uh, 
And that is, uh, you know, like a diagram because blending, as the word shows, it means that you mix everything to combine everything and uh, you should combine it in a way that you can reach to an effective clinical education. Uh, Long before Corona time, and by long, I mean maybe two years ago, three years ago, because when it comes to technology enhanced learning, uh, the time is so short, the advancement is short, so short. Uh, long before this Corona time, you know, face-to-face -face learning was uh, separated from e-learning strategies, and e-learning strategies was growing up. Uh, around Corona time, in most universities, we had some kind of blending not purposefully maybe, not planned uh, systematically in the school or university, but professors used technology in their education routinely. And what to do for now is to blend it more and to minimize the physical presence and to apply more technology enhanced learning in our teaching process. Now we come to, uh, to the point that uh, I would like to give you four main models of uh, blended learning. You know, there are lots of blended learning models in the um, literature and text when you read. But I have picked these four because I think that it, it will have its own message for all professors to, uh, to have an idea of how to blend their courses. Let's go through each of them very briefly. By rotation model, uh, we mean that learners rot rotate between learning, mod learning modalities. And uh, it could be a schedule. For example, this event is uh, ritual, this event is in person, and you should participate in a timetable in these uh, modalities. And what the most of the learning, as literature says, uh, you know, it is, it's just a definition, of course, uh, occurs in virtual camp in a physical campus and the flipped classroom that uh, professor isabel mentioned is one of the most classic examples of this kind of blending uh, so we can use this model for blending our courses and we can ignore that uh, learning occurs mostly in physical campus when it comes to covid 19 time the other model, flex model, is one, I would like to ask all uh, colleagues, audience, to uh, think of your course and uh, try to imagine how can, can you deliver your course, uh, you know, uh, under the umbrella of one of these models, you know, it, it will help us during this uh, webinar. Flex model, in this model, learners switch between, between learning modalities on a customized fluid schedule. So it is not predetermined. And e-learning is its backbone, you know? Uh, there is more emphasis on e-learning part. And, uh, you know, students are somehow self-paced and they are more uh, self-regulated in this uh, model of uh, blended learning. In the previous model, that, uh, this, uh, that was the instructor, the teacher who planned everything, the modalities, the timetable, the switch between e-learning and uh, face-to-face uh, -face training, all was planned with, uh, by the instructor, uh, the other model is a la carte, or uh, in French, if you send courses in addition to their face-to-face -face ones. And it is a great option for elective courses during, uh, you know, in a curriculum. Uh, in this model, during COVID time, you can select the courses that could be taught uh, totally uh, in e-learning approach, and then deliver it to a student as an additional course to their routine curricula that is blended somehow with face-to-face -face and uh, e-learning approaches. And the last model that I'm going to talk about, and I love it, is Enrich Virtual Model. This model allows learners to complete majority of course in uh, e-learning approach, but they attend uh, to uh, in a school for uh, some 
parts of the curriculum that needs face-to-face -face interaction and practice. Uh, and in this model, you don't need your student to attend this, uh, in a daily routine in the university, as Prof. Isabel said, we can minimize it to one or two days a week. So this model can work a lot when you are talking of, um, you know, uh, COVID time. Uh, and if, another point to add, even you can blend two or three of these models to, uh, you know, design your uh, teaching process in your clinical setting. So uh, when you are talking of blending, you should be able to think more than just blending virtual and face-to-face -face components. Even when it comes to virtual component, you should be able to combine different strategies of e-learning to reach to the most uh, effectiveness possible uh, within your uh, setting. So. Let's uh, reach to this question and continue our journey with this question, which model works the best for clinical education? Uh, for determining the best model for your setting, of course, you need to pay attention to several factors. You need to pay attention to your learner's level. Uh, Preclinic uh, students, preclectic pre pre students, clerkship ones or resident ones, they are different. They are all totally different. You should be able to think of different e-learning strategies. You should be able to think of course requirements and learning objective, objectives. And you should consider social distancing as a main factor during COVID-19 time. And the most important question is what your facilities are. Uh, during uh, your uh, during the presentation of the chancellor of the university, I understood which time, which tools are used usually in Basra University. So teachers should be aware that these are the facilities they have for the e-learning part. For example, they have Google Class, they have social media groups like in Telegram, WhatsApp, uh, and so on. So you should be aware, and you should uh, you know. Um, learn, you should train your faculty members to be familiar with different facilities and tools and how to apply them, how to use them in their teaching process. And when you consider all these factors, you should redesign your course uh, to reach the objective of minimum attendance in the clinical city setting relevant to the level of your uh, learners and students. Now, this is the diagram that shows that you can you, uh, combine different uh, aspects, different approaches like in-person teaching, social media, the LMS you use, e-contents, uh, different types of simulations to uh, have a, an effective clinical education. Uh, let me review briefly some steps on how to blend a clinical course. Uh, and I would like to ask you to have your example in your mind. And uh, when I'm talking, just uh, have a brief review on your own context and do these steps in your mind uh, uh, with me. First, list, uh, please list tasks and, and must knows in clinical setting in your work. You know, uh, you can say that, for example, I'm working in the internal medicine world, and we have some activities like morning report, case presentation, problem solving, book reviews, I don't know everything. And my learners, my students should be able to learn a specific tasks through participating in these activities. Now that you have the list of your activities and must to knows you can categorize them into three main groups. The ones that should be trained in person, for example, clinical examination, some aspects of communication skill in face-to-face -face, uh, setting. There are uh, some um, uh, groups of activities that are better to be trained in person, but we can do something for them to be trained virtually. And when we have the crisis of COVID-19, maybe it is more cost effective 
to do it mostly virtually. So we can categorize them in the, uh, under the umbrella of better to be trained in person. And there are also so many must-to-knows and activities that could be trained via e-learning strategies. I would like to emphasize on why I have put the second group. Because as far as all of us, I, I'm sure we agree, after uh, the COVID-19 goes out, inshallah, okay, we will, uh, we, we, we will not come back to the status of pre-corona time. So we, uh, and we will, we will have, and we are forced to change our uh, instructional design for delivering our curriculum. So for the second group, when the COVID finishes, we can make them again in face-to-face -face delivery. But we can keep the ones that could be totally trained via e-learning strategies. As Prof. Isabel said, the ones that they don't need to uh, listen to our lectures, they can read them, they can practice them themselves. So the second group is somehow in, a, in the middle range. Uh, you can decide on them whether you can, you can deliver them virtually or in person. The third step, you can determine your tools and facilities. And the university administrative should be able to provide a list of facilities and tools for their faculty member. And they should teach them how to use them. These tools could be either the ones that are for university, for example, a special LMS that is announced by the university that could be used for uh, teaching. This, this could be the facilities for e-content development, for example, and the ones that are open source and free in the internet that could be used by faculty members. For example, the ones that are used for e-portfolio, they, uh, they, the, um, they are free good tools that are provided in internet for e-portfolios, for assessment, and so on. But the faculty members should be familiar with these tools and have a list of them that they are capable to be used in teaching learning process. And then it comes to the point that you can select the type of blending you want to use and apply in your course. Uh, maybe in a ward, in a clinical setting, you can flip some parts of uh, activities. You can use e-contents as another part. You can, for example, enrich your curriculum, enrich your setting with some augmented or virtual reality aspects, you know? So there are different types of blending. And by this blending, I don't mean even, uh, only a blending face-to-face -face with um, e-learning approach. When it comes to e-learning, you can blend different e-learning strategies together as well. So in this way, you design your course and it is an active process. I suppose that last semester, most of us had the approach of try and error because we were shocked. But for now, we should plan for our course, how to blend it. And then, we should ask a student's opinion on the program. They are a good resource. They have the experience of one semester of anxiety. You know, they were anxious last semester, different experiences. Some of them love some aspects of uh, the course that was delivered. Some of them have some critics to our, what they have, uh, you know, uh, last semester. You should ask their opinion on the program that you have designed. And of course, this is an important point. You should think of students and program evaluation systematically, not by try and error and just waiting for, you know, challenges to uh, come and then solving them. You should anticipate everything for your teaching, learning, cl clinical setting. And the main objective now is to minimize physical presence for each level of students in clinical setting. As a conclusion, I would like to give you a sample scenario. It's just a sample, you know, it's not, uh, you know, I've not worked on it with a group 
for example, in a department to reach a net scenario, but it can uh, provide you with an idea of how to blend your clinical education. The sample scenario is that, imagine that you have your target group is pre preclinical medical students, and their number in each rotation is about 10 students. And the word, the uh, clinical word is internal medicine. We perform instructional design and reach to the combination of enriched virtual and flipped model of delivery. In this approach, as you can see in the slide, you can divide your course into two uh, parts, virtual part and in-person part. For virtual part, you can decide as you see, for example, you can provide the facility of participating in activities like morning reports online. You are running morning reports and clinical runs with your residents in your actual ward. You can provide the facility of launching online to these events for the students that are at their home. You know, this is some kind of mixed or blended delivery, for example, as a, of an event like morning report. Okay, you can provide the facility of case discussions in different social media or forum discussion boards within, for example, an LMS. Uh, I would like to emphasize on, on peer learning. You should define, you can define activities that students perform together. As uh, it was said, they can teach each other. They can collaborate to do a project to solve a problem, to solve a difficult case and so on. You can provide a wide range of multimedia e-content for the theoretical aspects of your uh, curriculum. And you, you can provide them collaborative teamwork, even with very simple tools like Google Docs or Google Sheets. Collaborative team, the collaborative team work, they work a lot when you provide them for your students. And of course, you're, you can think of some simulations like virtual patients. And when you come to simulations, you, you know, I, I, I know that in um, countries like Iraq and Iran, sometimes we are uh, in lack of uh, budgets for developing high-tech uh, simulations. But sometimes these, these simulations are not so complicated and they can be easily designed. And, and they need uh, you know, intelligent and clever um, professors to work on it rather than having a special large, huge amount of budget. For example, to provide a platform uh, that includes different virtual patients on must knows and better to knows of the curriculum. And then it leaves for you only some uh, special aspects of the curriculum that should be delivered in person. So you can minimize the presence of your pre students to, for example, two days or one day a week planned for a you know, practicing those parts that could not be covered virtually. This is just a sample of the output of a comprehensive instructional design that could be applied in, in a clinical setting. Uh, sometimes in Tehran University, we deliver workshops that during, for example, a four or three hour, uh, our, you know, um, virtual workshop, online workshop, we teach our, uh, we train our faculty members, clinical faculty members to, uh, you know, design their clinical education in a way that they come to a, a product that uh, it is feasible. It is the uh, mostly, or let's say somehow the best solution possible regarding the facilities, budget, human resource, and so on. And at the end of that workshop, they have a solution for their work that they can work further on it to make it as a complete uh, educational program. So it would work in your university as well if you, uh, you know, have some capacity building programs for your faculty members that during a workshop, they work on a plan to uh, have a draft 
as a suggestion to their department to, uh, to be delivered to the student in their own clinical setting. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm ready for question and answer at the end of the uh, event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rita, for this nice presentation. Thank you for valuable information. Uh, uh, now we will go to our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Mohammadi. Hello. Dr. Mohammadi uh, has PhD in medical education. And uh, he is one of the. Sorry, uh, I have to mute the mic. Now oh, it's okay. Our speaker from Iran, uh, Dr. Mohammadi, uh, he has a PhD in medical education, and he is one of the founders of virtual school of Tehran University of Medical Sciences, and currently a faculty member of e-learning and medical education department in this school. And he is a vice chancellor of, uh, for infrastructure of virtual university of medical sciences, uh, a new established university. He has performed several developmental and research projects in the field of e-learning and medical education in Iran, some of, which, uh, some of which are academic ranking of medical schools, stratification of uh, educational services, metric systems for, faculty, for faculties, uh, members' activities, and comprehensive educational award system, and comprehensive system of e-continuous medical education, national institutional accreditation system of e-learning centers and so on. Now he is, uh, he as uh, the manager uh, is working on development of Iran's national massive open online courses MOOCs platform and national learning management system LMS. And he has published uh, several articles and books in related fields. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammadi for joining us today. Uh, you can start your presentation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hello, everybody. First of all, let me thank my dear colleagues at the University of Basra and other universities all over the Iraq. And uh, thank you all for attending this workshop today and uh, thanking you for inviting me to deliver my lecture in this uh, valuable uh, workshop. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, presentations uh, of uh, dear uh, Professor Isabel and uh, Professor Mushtaizadeh, and uh, I would like to thank them too. Uh, as you have seen uh, in the workshop agenda, the topic I want to present in this section is e-learning in medical sciences education definition and brief uh, review. In this presentation, we are going to review briefly e-learning definition the types and some of its important aspects. It's worth mentioning that most of uh, the topics uh, and approximately all of the topics uh, of my lecture have discussed in previous sections. And uh, I only uh, am going to review these topics. And uh, as you know, it's extremely important to have the same concepts on e-learning terminology. Firstly, let's have a short review on the history of distance learning. It may be interesting to know uh, that the distance education emerged in concurrence with the development of railway system in 19th. In long uh, widespread and Australia. The first instances were posting print packages by train to different remote areas of those countries. Afterward, newer technologies, namely radio, television, and then the internet were used in this regard. Meanwhile, uh, there happened to establish dual mode universities uh, covering both distance and face-to-face -face, uh, 
education. To clarify more, uh, in high population, uh, in high uh, population countries uh, of the developing world, DLN has offered very significant opportunities for education. Meanwhile, they still have to handle infrastructure and professional competency issues uh, to improve the DLN. On the other hand, in this industrialized countries have utilized DLN to cover the needs of lifelong learning, mass education, and training of new skills, as uh, these uh, needs are uh, the ones that could not be easily met by conventional institutions. After this brief history, it is worth mentioning that one encounters a variety of terminologies related to different models of non-face-to-face -face study. Obviously, we should uh, be used in their proper meaning. As an example, distance learning emphasizes on physical separation of instructors and learners, regardless of the substitution, substituted media used for their communication. Considering this concept, e-learning is a type of distance learning in which communication occur through the the media of the internet. Hence, the definition of e-learning has changed within recent years because of development of related technologies and emerging new instructional methods. Anyhow, in the last versions, e-learning is defined as the use of the internet for enhancing teaching learning process. In other words, the e-learning refers application of internet technologies to deliver any solution that enhances learners knowledge and performance. In spite of the fact that this definition is widely used, it does not include some ap uh, approaches such as uh, augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, or some kinds of simulations. Hence, one should consider this point while using this uh, interpretation. At this point of presentation, we are going to review a sample of statistics which show the rapid growth in e-learning uh, deployment all over the world. Figures uh, show that approximately 80% uh, of companies in North America uh, apply online learning, among which 50% deliver at least one training session via e-learning in each year. To add more details, about 80% of employers have participated in e-learning courses. Here, why one may ask if the internet limitation in like Middle East and Asia would play a barrier role for e-learning implementation compared to regions such as North America. To answer this question, let's look at the internet penetration rate at the most important infrastructure uh, for implementing e-learning. Considering the internet penetration rate of 95% uh, in North America compared to uh, more than 60% uh, in Middle East, one assumes that uh, e-learning dissemination in Middle East region is absolutely feasible and internet access is not considered as a barrier. Actually, Okay, uh, after reviewing these uh, statistics, let's uh, take a look at e-learning types, namely asynchronous and synchronous e-learning. All right, actually in synchronous e-learning, instructors and learners communicate at the same time, so that time limitation remains. Webinar sessions, virtual classes, real-time conferences are good example of this type. And as uh, Professor Isabel told, software such as Adobe Connect, Zoom, Skype, uh, and some of the famous platforms used for running these events. On the other hand, the asynchronous e-learning time, e uh, time limitation doesn't exist, and instructors and learners don't need to communicate 
communicate at the same time. As an example, imagine that an instructor provides learners with content and related assignments through some web-based platform. Then learners study the contents and a platform uh, and perform their task in uh, their own pace and time. In the whole of this presentation, I discuss in uh, asynchronous e-learning and especially using LMS for interaction. Uh, in a recent published journal in uh, JAMA, uh, they told that the experiences in uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis showed that sync asynchronous uh, e-learning is more suitable in all over the world, both in developing and on the and developed countries. Okay, at this point, we're going to highlight some points of strengths and weaknesses of e-learning. Let's start with strengths points, among which some of the most important ones are as follows. Students have access to the content in any time and uh, any place that it's uh, the most famous uh, advantages of e-learning. Contents could be enriched by multimedia to promote deep learning, especially in uh, teaching uh, clinical aspects and procedures. Searching and navigation facilities provide an unlimited access to resources. Learners can use material and resources discontinuously. The possibility of being interactive uh, that is known as the heart of an e-learning context. Indeed, there are several effective type of, uh, types of uh, interactions in e-learning, including teacher-learner interaction via tools like assignments and uh, messaging systems, learner-learner interactions via tools uh, like discussion groups and forums, and learner content interaction. Sharing the experience and knowledge with others at a distance is uh, one of uh, the other advantages of e-learning. And uh, finally, organized data gathering from uh, students' activities. As a matter of fact, one can name more advantages for e-learning that are not listed here. After reviewing uh, e-learning definition, types, cons, and pros, uh, from this point forward, uh, some pedagogical, uh, excuse me, okay, uh, before that, uh, I'm going to uh, mention some weaknesses of uh, e-learning. Usually we uh, medical educationists don't like to mention about weaknesses of e-learning and I uh, miss uh, them. Lack of personal contact. Uh, limitations for demonstrating of clinical procedures and actual practice with missions that discussed, uh, is discussed in previous section completely. Difficulties in adopting both teacher and a student to new ways of communicating and using new technologies. Having to cope with technological problems during the course uh, like uh, internet uh, interruption or uh, shortage of bandwidth. Difficulties in measuring online students' learning outcomes and the attendance. That Professor Isabel uh, told about this very uh, completely. And other weaknesses, so on. To some of virtual learning advantages and disadvantages, please look, uh, take a look at this slide, which demonstrates some differences between e-learning and traditional face-to-face -face setting and see if you agree all of them. In e-learning, we can save money in development, travel, and time. Uh, E-learning is great for specific concise topics. In e-learning, students can take anywhere, anytime. Uh, and uh, e-learning takes uh, about 50% less time than classroom instructions. It's better for remote uh, traveling or high turnover populations. And in e-learning, students can pause, uh, reread, uh, or uh, test out of contents. And 
uh, in opposite in traditional learning, uh, it's better uh, use, uh, there are uh, there is better use of time for highly complex information. It's great for collaborative topics. Uh, in traditional learning, students can ask questions or role play uh, situations uh, uh, real time. They can help uh, in traditional learning, we can help students feel more valued. Students learn from each other and highly skilled trainers can adopt information for students. After reviewing e-learning definition types and cause and pros, from this point forward, some pedagogical aspects are discussed. Firstly, we start with main components of an e-learning system that's are undoubtedly focused on promoting teacher-student interaction. The first and the most important component is content development and delivery that is considered as the key factor for system success. In fact, the way one designed the course directly affects learning outcomes. The second one is IT infra infrastructure by which one means issues like bandwidth, hardware and software. And the last one, which is uh, availability of suitable approved rules and regulations that are necessary for learning dissemination in any uh, university. Hereby, we reach to the point of discussing two pedagogical uh, approaches in instructional design of an online course. Uh, considering the type of interaction and the task, there are two main e-learning design types, namely instructor-led versus student-led e-learning design. On one side, uh, uh, in a student-led class, students are in charge of their learning and they are the ones who decide when to study, what to study more, and in which sequence tasks are performed. On the opposite side, a teacher-led classroom is designed basically regarding teacher's decisions. In this context, while students seem quiet and controlled, the teachers take responsibility for what students need. In other, word, in other words, in this model, not only instructional approaches are structured, sequenced, and led by teachers, but also these uh, are teachers who present academic content to students, such as what happens in a lecture or demonstration. To make it more tangible, uh, in student-led classes, teachers uh, play the role of tutor or mentor, and uh, that is guiding on the side, as Professor Isabel told in his lecture. In contrast to uh, teacher-led classes, uh, where teachers uh, role in direct teaching labeled as sage on the stage. Here, we come to define a routinely used terminology that is blended learning and has discussed completely in previous sections. It is not too long ago that some education is believed in a total substitution of face-to-face uh, courses with online ones, but time showed that it was not the case, especially in medical sciences. And the second wave of e-learning emerged widely in the world uh, that is known as blended learning. Indeed, current pedagogical evidence declared that in many instances, e-learning alone would not be sufficient and holding a face-to-face -face classes is a necessity. Actually, blended learning is a style of education in which students learn by electronic and online media as well as traditional face-to-face -face teaching. This figure shows the relationship between these types of learning which has discussed in other uh, sections. To provide more details on blended learning, looking at some statistics uh, would be helpful. A study performed 70% of teachers use blended learning who declared uh, two main reasons for doing so. 
One is increasing students engagement and improving academic achievements. And second is saving their time and energy. All right. At this point, uh, we change the topic to another uh, one as I have used the term content repeatedly in my presentation. In this last part of my talk, we uh, go through its meaning and types. Generally speaking, e-learning is digital text and images designed uh, for uh, being displayed on the web pages. As I mentioned before, e-content development is the heart of teaching learning process. Content development requires uh, expert knowledge in the subject area, patience in creating the uh, necessary objects that make, uh, make up quality uh, and a high sense of creativity in structuring and sequencing the topics to make a complete whole. This slide shows a continuum, including different types of e-learning, e-content, sorry, that begin with e-books and the handouts, uh, followed by PowerPoints, podcasts, different kinds of podcasts, enhanced podcasts with animation, video podcasts and audio podcasts, voice synchronized with slides, uh, simulations and animations, and finally, collaborative learning uh, content. This variety shows the importance of getting familiar with their characteristics in order to use them properly. To wrap up the presentation hereby, I reviewed main e-learning concepts and some important terminology briefly. However, there remains a last point worth mentioning. As a new progressive domain, one should remain up to date, uh, up to date uh, when it uh, comes to field related to cyberspace. And e-learning is not an except in this regard. Okay, at the, the, at the end of my uh, presentation, I would like to emphasize on some facts and misconcepts based on e-learning principles. Most of these uh, facts and misconcepts have derived from our experiences during uh, COVID-19 crisis. And knowing these facts and misconceptions would uh, help teachers to deliver an effective uh, e-learning. Okay. Uh, what do you think? I only need, uh, need Zoom. Uh, sorry. I... Uh, I only need Zoom uh, or some uh, tools like uh, that to run my classes. What do you think? Uh, everybody who agrees with this statement uh, sent uh, the number 22 in the chat room box and other uh, persons who disagree, who disagree uh, please send uh, 33. Okay. Thank you. Okay. As you know, e-learning is not equal to synchronous online learning. In many cases, asynchronous e-learning, for example, through an LMS works the best. The other statement and misconcept is, one should develop multimedia or video content to be able to deliver an e-course. What do you think? Okay, as you know, e-learning is not equal to e-content, such as multimedia videos or other types of e-content. Uh, think of course objectives and learners need to choose the best content. And uh, maybe uh, some 
uh, e-contents such as reference books or published articles are more suitable for postgraduate students. Okay, and another one. I don't like, like the university's LMS. I can't teach well in this platform. What do you think? Don't forget that you govern the software and IT facilities are only a tool uh, beside the teachers. Make the best out of the accessible technologies. I need to upload files with larger sizes and variety of formats. I need to run synchronous classes and so on. What do you think about this statement? Okay, uh, don't forget that you are the provider and the students are the users. What, uh, what is uh, their idea? Uh, please don't forget students' bandwidth and the, the cost of internet for them. Are they happy with your decisions? And I don't have enough experience. What are the three key factors for a good uh, e-teaching? In my uh, suggestions, uh, these three key factors are most uh, important. Don't overload students with information and tasks. Deliver an interactive course and make the best out of blending. And finally, blended learning is combining e-learning and face-to-face -face classes. And what do you think? As it discussed in previous sections, blend with different contexts and strategies, face-to-face, -face, LMS-based, uh, MOOCs, Zoom, virtual and augmented reality, social networks, and face-to-face -face sessions for especially clinical students. Thank you very much. And these are some uh, references I used for preparing this lecture. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammadi, for this nice presentation and valuable information. Thanks for polling. And uh, really, we have poll in Zoom, but uh, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have an idea about your lecture. Uh, then we can uh, put the poll in the Zoom and do it for the participant. Thank you again. Now we reach to our uh, last uh, lecture today. Uh, presented by uh, Dr. Murtada Al-Musafir, the Vice Dean of uh, College of Medicine of Basra University. Uh, you can start uh, your presentation, Dr. Murtada. And then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jawad Al-Khurasan. Thank you, Dr. Murtada. Thank you very much, Dr. Qutaybe. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all our guest speakers uh, for accepting our invitation uh, to participate in this meeting. And also I would like to thank all the participants and those who organized this uh, meeting and thank you for moderator. The, this uh, slide and this Subsequent slide, uh, I will discuss in summary what we did in uh, University of Basra College of Medicine uh, for the uh, uh, last year and what we did, where we are, and what we are looking for. So there is a sentence or paragraph, small paragraph by Albert Einstein who says, I never teach my students. I only attempt to provide 
the conditions in which they can learn. So this is very important. You should make the environment suitable for learning for the students. Uh, really, it was a challenging year for the students and for the teaching staff because it carries a lot and you know the situation of pandemic. And we shift the process from bizarre into a more organized one. And this carried out by coordination between the university represented by the chancellor and the university staff, deans, teaching staff, and all of these in uh, assistance, with assistance of the IT make things possible. And we have also had an old experience in summative and formative examinations during the last years. We organized the students into classes using Google Classroom, Telegram channels, Google Meet, Zooms, FCC, ETC. Supply students with official emails in order to be enrolled officially in the classes with the creation of video lectures, which include the theoretical part in addition to a simulation and a video simulation. We use both synchronous and asynchronous learning. And to start with, the students were reluctant to this style of learning. But as we know, after a huge uh, work, the, we make the students uh, more, um, they love the uh, e-learning more. The concentration was on clinical scenarios because you know that a medical student need to manage a patient. Clinical examination in a skill lab, videos, as I said, discussing clinical cases on Telegram, Zoom sessions, and so on. Also, we have a rule in telemedicine uh, through the consultation medical center of University of Basra. And we start managing patients by using telemedicine. Also, we developed uh, the, our teaching platform uh, and it's called e-learning. And this is very important, uh, a platform uh, and it was used in the educational process. Online examination, it was a good experience and choice during COVID-19 pandemic with some limitations due to some internet problems, minimal technical problems, the problem of student evaluation. But as Dr. Um, Isabel said, we use a lot of support of students directly, like loan of devices, with iPad and phones. Also, we didn't forget e-conferences and workshops in order to develop our experience, student training. Also, uh, we have a lot of things in cooperation with the Basra Health, Health Directories, Directorate. Also, we developed our web at the University of Basra, and it contains a lot of open educational resources for the students. And now the concept of learning, a blended learning is evolved, and we are starting to gain more development of our infrastructures with the creation of smart hall for, um, doing the video lectures and video clinical examinations. The blended learning is joined the best features of any class teaching with the best features of online learning to promote active independent learning. And thank you very much.
العفو دكتور مرتضى دكتور قتيبة I am finished uh, Thank you دكتور مرتضى uh, for presentation Thank you very much uh, uh, What about دكتور جواد الخراساني Yes Next to me is دكتور جواد to complete our experience in الزهراء uh, College of Medicine Yes Thank you شكرا جزيلا دكتور قتيبة Thank you. Just you allow me, allow me to share the screen. Okay, just a minute. Yeah. Is this okay? Yes, it's okay. Okay. On screen, Victor Jawad. On screen. Yeah. On screen, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Victor Potaiba. Thank you for the Chancellor of Basra University, and thank you for our special guests, uh, Professor uh, Rita, Professor Isabel, and Professor Mohammadi. Dear audience, good afternoon, and I hope you become safe and so. Um, on behalf of Al Zahra College of Medicine and the Scientific and uh, Curriculum Committee, I will present the experience in our college during the, uh, the COVID era. Uh, the objectives is um, to start with the, who we are and how we deliver the e-learning in our college and the way of assessment that we use, the positive things that we uh, inquired and any points need to be improved. <clears throat> Azara College of Medicine started since the academic year 1718, so it's just only three years college. Uh, it is uh, born from the mother college of the Basra Medical College and it's adapt in a six year integrated outcome based curriculum. Uh, the college from the beginning is used on ear learning using the model and the other facilities, the telegram and the group discussion with the students. So our teaching staff and students already, they have their experience in e-learnings uh, from the beginning. In the era we are using a classroom, we arrange our modules into a classroom, different classrooms and we invite the students with their uh, university email, and we have the uh, uh, classroom suits. So it gives us a lot of uh, uh, facilities during electronic teaching. And in these classrooms, and again into the Moodle, we uh, upload the working books, the references, the lectures in different ways, and uh, uh, special tasks, special uh, um, uh, self-learning, self-directed learning topics, and all these things uh, are sent for the student for, for, from a time from the uh, 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 real uh, uh, attendance. And so they are preparing themselves before they are attending uh, the working sessions. And really this is the, uh, uh, the preparation day, which is uh, 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 before, the, uh, before the era, which is converted into an uh, online preparation day that all the lectures not uh, uh, performed by single teachers. We have an, a, a module staff preparing the lecture, discussing the things, and then uh, uploading the lectures using uh, our module staff, all the module staff uh, 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 sharing uh, in the lecture. And again, we, we put the uh, lectures in the classroom or in the model in different modalities, uh, helping the student to copy these things or uh, uh, listening to the uh, 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 to the lecturer, uh, uh, and then with some instruction that can be given by the module leaders about the things, the specific things or specific tasks needed to be prepared before the day of the session. Uh, we use synchronous and non-synchronous uh, uh, teaching. Uh, we use the timetable for pre-COVID uh, era. Uh, each module have on a day and we complete the day for each module. We use the lecture time for discussion. As we send the lecture using the sound and videos for the student, so we didn't like to re-deliver it again. We open the lecture and we discuss with the students uh, uh, anything vague or any questions or some tasks that we give uh, to the student in the, in, the, in, the pre, in the lectures that we deliver on, on the classroom. 
I'll use uh, some questions through the lectures as self-directed learning. Um, the attendance for, for this uh, uh, work is by uh, many or a couple of teaching staffs, uh, each one of them having a specific task uh, 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 to, to work. Some of them are uh, as collecting the questions, answering the students on the chat, uh, 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 um, evaluating the activities, and at the end, all the records links will send to the students. Uh, he can uh, he can uh, recall uh, these uh, uh, activity. Uh, this is an example of how we record using an attendance uh, Google Attendance Meet, and this is the uh, at the end of the session. Some teachers uh, record the the presence of the. Uh, 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 of the student or it's just online or, or some activity that they have and the questions are answered. And this is the video record sent, the link sent for the student at the end. And we have an asynchronous uh, uh, learning. It's mainly done by, by the student themselves. And they answer uh, the questions or the questions between them on a Telegram group supervised by, by the teachers. And we can follow them uh, to correct any uh, uh, um, uh, bizarre or uh, any uh, any mistakes or any information need to be corrected, but really they are directing themselves for deep learning in in in, in their time at night or afternoon. In this example, they share between them the videos and the questions and answer, and they are this very very nice. Uh, uh, topics they they discussing and sometimes we need to enter and uh, and help them and most of the time we didn't enter. Uh, the assessment uh, we use different modalities of assessment. We we are uh, uh, assessing the attendance of the student between two practice. Uh, uh, um, those who are is uh, enrolled in the session and they are not active, so it is just attend. We, we sent for them a message in the chat or ask their names to participate uh, actively in the session. We use the quizzes and we have a lot of uh, points against the quizzes. We use it last year, but, but uh, it, it has an, a lot of uh, problems that uh, um, in addition to the cheating, uh, they make the students uh, avoiding uh, 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 presence in the lectures before the quiz. So we need to think this year, uh, we, we adopt the quizzes or not. Uh, we use mainly the reports for, for self-directed learning and uh, weekly reflections. And I think we need to uh, concentrate on, on the reports and the weekly reflection better than using the quizzes. And we schedule the quizzes in order not to load the students uh, about the quizzes. We spare uh, every week, not more than two quizzes in a, a timetable it is announced for the student and for the lectures for the lecturers and teaching staff uh, in order not to make, make the student busy all the time by, by sorry by doing the uh, quizzes and every week we have or every six uh, sessions we have an assumption of of the student activity by the module leaders about their attendance their activity their quizzes their reflections uh, and this is reported for every student. Um, we have on a self-directed learning subjects. We give it a very good experience for the student to use the electronic tools in order to, uh, 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 to deeply learn the subjects. And we found that they, they have, during the reflection or after reading the reflection of them, we found that these reports help them to deeply understand a specific subject. And again, we use a multiple formative assessment for them. We send them problem solving, and we have another way of making deeply learned. Uh, uh, we send them on uh, some exercise about how to write good questions. Uh, and really, they, they write on a very nice questions, and uh, the curriculum committee and the assessment committee use some of these questions from the students. Not less than 10 to 15 percent of the questions in the exam paper is from the student themselves, and then we have we use the personal and professional development program in order to uh, um, all the students are are shared with a specific tutor or uh, or mentor, 
uh, and we we have an, uh, reflections weekly reflections about their activities and they report uh, their uh, um, learning experience for example they reports how do their learning experience and how how they they uh, uh, focus on where is this strength in their learning experience where is the weakness and how they put an, a learning uh, uh, how they put an action plan for their their weaknesses and this is an example of of the students uh, uh, portfolios uh, that it is sent for us to know everything about their work and they are writing it very in very good way and again there is a questionnaire sent for the students about a personal development plan and academic development and we 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 um we conclude from these things um, uh, what is the things that in their mind to share them uh, in improving the way of learning and teaching in our college and again we we sense for reflection or rewards from the doctors from the friends uh, from certain student to know uh, um, uh, what they happens for them again we use an, uh, uh, reports or self reflection reports at the end of the semester they discuss everything that happens during the semester and point uh, that they face and we learn a lot of from these uh, uh, activities what what is the problems that happens in the students and share them in making us uh, taking a good decision for the next semester um, in the end assessment or end of the semester assessment we use on a short answer questions um, uh, we don't use the true false because of, of guess and and uh, cheating still i think we are the only college using the short answer questions in, in their end semester assessment plus the best answer questions oski is now is stopped and we need to think in the blended teaching to resume oski for for uh, uh, for the further examination uh, already we use the bloom and i agree with the professor isabel we use the high taxonomy blooms type of questions in order to reduce the cheating and again we need to cover all these subjects and, and we have this is modification of of each module uh, we divide into each session and which question is given in summative or in the quiz or in the formative assessment and then we need to cover all the subjects in order to reduce the selection of student to read which session is read more or the session is not read it so uh, so we, we we divide the sessions and we divide the questions from each session and even to cover each learning objective so we have this map to cover almost all the red one is is not given so in the next or in the reset or in the other examination we need to cover the questions that it is uh, uh, in the red in the red color and again we divide it into which which one is better to be asked in short answer which one is better to be asked in in in, in a best answer question and then we have a post assessment uh, uh, post examination assessment that each piece of the questions we need to know what is the uh, marks that it takes and we have any questions about say this one this question explain the easy changes to be prominent in some of the 12 leads we need to find uh, why the student having a 45 percent right answer and again we know that that this question is for the session six this question for the session one learning objective two this is for the session five this is for session nine eight seven and again we know where is the weakness uh, 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 um, in which session we have an, a, a low percentage of answering and again we need to know why this is a question because it is that it's 100 percent answered because it's direct just list uh, remembering list four organs in the body having sinusoid and it's for the first year uh, assessment paper we found we expect that this student will answer 100 percent because it's a straightforward uh, question we have a lot of surveys post-assessment surveys and we have a reward uh, 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 results from that about their opinion about the difficulty this example of one questions that is the is the overall difficulty of the questions or overall relevance of the questions to what you read or the uh, 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 your experience that you expect your colleague how you how the the percentage of your colleagues 
will be succeed in that examination, all these surveys performed after the each assessment. And the points that need to be evaluated more is, uh, um, is the ways how to make the student more engaged, not just attend, how they make them actively participate in the e-learning. Then we have an, another problem, which is overestimation of the student marks. Really, we compared the student marks between this year and the previous year, we found that there is some picture of, of um, raise the possibility of overestimation. So they don't take real mark. Uh, and this is uh, uh, not because we don't, we didn't like to give the marks, but probably it gives a false impression for the student to think that they are good or they are well. Uh, we need to, to um, uh, talk to them that this is an overestimation and you need to learn or talk on certain topics, especially after the post-assessment, uh, uh, post-examination assessment, we found which student that he has some a weakness in certain modules we need to through the mentor personal tutor we need to send them a, a message that you have uh, said in the tissue of the video you have a uh, low marks you need to concentrate on these topics uh, still we we play a lot of things about reducing the cheating in the examination but really this is an, a, a, a points that uh, 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 that cannot be eliminated what we did in our college is is uh, using talk with the patient to this with the student in order to make them self-aware about themselves and i think this is the only method in electronic teaching is to talk with the student uh, um, uh, do the personal reflection with them through the personal tutor through multiple meetings that we did in order to make them self-aware about themselves rather than uh, 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 just we, we make them a, a score a score uh, uh, seekers, uh, uh, we need we need to talk with them and and uh, improve their feeling that they are aware about themselves, aware, aware about their responsibility, their future work. Uh, this these things I think it's act uh, very well in reducing the cheating by asking the student to depend on themselves. Uh, we need to have some change in the evaluation process. I, I greatly appreciate the talk of evaluation by. Uh, Professor Isabel, we need to use a high level taxonomy, uh, uh, Bloom taxonomy uh, questions, open uh, questions, thinking questions in order to uh, know the thought process rather than remembering of the, uh, of the uh, material. And uh, I, am, I am happy to learn or, or to, um, to listen about a lot of things that uh, that uh, presented by Professor Rita and Professor Mohammed about the blending, blended learning, and we try to select the best way uh, for our student. And uh, in the next week, we have on a trial uh, with our student to use on a, 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 a way of attending the uh, the a minimum student number to the college, and we will put on uh, some. Uh, 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 virtual world in the in the in the in the college and we start to have a role of play between the students uh, just just we need to know how how it's work in, in our college so thank you very much for your listening and thank you for uh, uh, making me an, a part of this uh, very nice activity uh, thank you dr Kotaib. Thank you very much, Dr. Jwad, for this uh, presentation. Thank you for sharing your experience uh, in e-learning uh, at El Zahra Medical College, University of Basra. It was great. Uh, now, uh, attendees, dear attendees, we reach to uh, uh, this is the, this is was the uh, last lecture uh, uh, in our webinar. Now we open the Q and A session. Uh, anyone have a question, uh, just raise hand or type your question in the chat, please. If you have any questions, please just raise your hand. Dr. Hsien, Dr. Hsien Abdissada, you can unmute your mic, please. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Fadal, Dr. Just unmute your mic, Dr. Please. 
we just uh, uh, face a difficult uh, status now. Uh, we thinking how we can help our student to get an information. Thank you for all for Dr. Saad, Isabel, Rita, and Dr. Mohammadi, and Dr. Murtaza, and Dr. Jawad. Uh, uh, for Dr. Isabel, uh, she really share us a valuable information. It is really like a roadmap now uh, for e-learning. We nicely share, uh, she nicely share a pyramide figure. You know the pyramid in the, in the uh, first layer, first uh, slides. Uh, a pyramid figure showed that the teaching by others is a qualify about 90% for ex excellence learning. This is very important pyramid. I think we need to share that with other uh, uh, members. The uh, learning from each other called a pair-pair interaction. Pair-pair interaction between students is very important. We need to concentrate on that. Uh, you know, I don't know whether Dr. Jawad said or not, uh, in Al-Zahra Medical College, we have this experience now. Our students in the holiday now, they make a, a class and they, each, uh, they learn each other uh, by this. And this is very important. But the question is, do you think, Dr. Isabel, do you think we can leave the, uh, the students making their, their interaction and learn each other without supervision? Or we need to, to guide a, them? Yeah, that is a really, really good question. <clears throat> I have experienced both ways. Um, uh, we have used uh, peer uh, to peer. There's, there's two things, actually. There's peer learning, teaching and learning, and then there is near peer. So peer would be same class, right? So a second year student with a second year student uh, or a four, fourth year with a fourth year, same class. And then there is near peer, <clears throat> which may have some advantages. Imagine a year four student um, um, helping or overseeing uh, a younger cohort, one year below them. Um, so I've been through all of this myself. I know what I, you know, this I found easy, this I found difficult. Um, let me help you through this. So in any case, I've, I've tried it both ways. Um, what I think is really important is some training and supervision in the initial phases by the uh, tutors. So what I have uh, done um, in, in my university is um, trained um, year three, excuse me, trained year four students to oversee um, and teach year three ones. I've also done it between two and one, but that was less effective, I have to admit, because they're still very, very young. Um, so the short answer is yes, provided you train them. Um, and what I trained them on really and truly was history taking, okay? History taking skills, because it's very common for students in our uh, medical school to feel rather uncomfortable to go up to a patient in the hospital and take a history without, um, you know, just walk up to someone and say, no, that history taking is a crucial part of, of learning, right? Of clinical medicine is very, very important. So um, we, we basically um, supervised uh, year four students and trained them um, into the position of the patient. So um, we gave them cases which again, I'm more than happy to share with any one of you, because I really do believe in the internationality of, of, uh, of learning here. Um, we gave them mock cases. We told them to practice answering the questions. So the student would say, uh, excuse me, um, uh, my name is um, so-and-so. I came here to ask you some questions. Where did, when, when did you have, when did the pain start, for example? And the fourth year student is now trained to say, um, the pain started um, um, last week, but it's got worse, blah, 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 blah. A bit like simulated patients, but instead of having uh, a patient do this, have a medical student do it. And the short answer Perfect. is it works. And um, I really would encourage all of you to incorporate this in, in uh, the, if you like, in the hidden curriculum, the, the curriculum which is not visible to all, um, uh, to all students. I Thank hope you I'm very much. Thank you, Professor Isabel. Uh, nice view behind you. Nice view. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Abdel Hussein. Dr. Kutayba, Dr. Kutayba, may I have a comment to complete the answer of uh, Dr. Hussein? Yes, please, Dr. Jawad Fadal. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kutayba. Really, uh, this is the first time that our student, the, the senior students, are helping the junior students start from the 10th of October. And really, it is supervised by me on, uh, they select very good time. And I really now are sharing these videos on the, uh, on the website of the university. And uh, what is nice is, is these videos um, are shared by the other college. And they ask me that some of the university students, other university students, they try to enter this um, workshop or, or trial of teaching beer to beer or uh, near beer, near beer to beer students. And they know some students from the uh, Al Kufa University and I think other university, they try to enter this with workshop that's supervised by, by our college and done by, by the senior uh, um, colleagues for their uh, junior colleagues. And I think a couple of them are attending this meeting. A couple of these students are attending this meeting uh, uh, from the uh, College of Medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jawad. Very good. It is a good experience. Uh, attendees, please, if you have any questions, just raise your hand before we uh, finish our webinar today. Uh, if anyone, uh, guest speakers, attendees, if anyone have uh, uh, comment or uh, any interaction, you can just uh, raise your hand. Dr. Hsien Hello, again. Dr. Kutaybe. Uh, Dr. Muqtad, Fadal. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Dr. Muqtad Al-Hijjaj. I'm uh, the Dean Assistant uh, for the College of Pharmacy, University of Basra. So I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers for uh, this wonderful uh, scientific event. Uh, many thanks for the organizers as well. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, just to have uh, two, two, two uh, important uh, comments. The first one is regarding the expectations of the students and the lecturers in the uh, uh, blended learning. So as you know, the uh, learning process is, is an interaction process between the students and the lecturers. Uh, so uh, do you think we, we need to, uh, to ask the students or to uh, uh, get the expectations from the students about how to achieve the objectives of the learning process in advance to achieve the maximum uh, outcomes from the learning process? So that's my, my point because uh, the process of learning is all about the expectations. So if we match the expectations of the students with the expectations of the lecturers and the outcomes of the curriculum, we probably will get more, uh, more outcomes from the uh, learning process. So that's, that's the first uh, point. The second point is related to the post-graduation uh, outcomes. So we are now we are now changing the uh, the the study this uh, the, the the teaching process. So this probably will have influences on the post graduation uh, uh, post graduation practices for the uh, uh, physicians, dentists, and the pharmacists and the all other medical professionals. So do we need to consider what will be the changes, or do we need to plan? Uh, how the uh, practices are changing after the graduation for the students. So that's uh, another thing. Uh, so probably we will think about some uh, changes in the post-graduation uh, uh, practices uh, be, be after the graduation process. So uh, if you have uh, any, uh, any uh, ideas about these two uh, comments, uh, please, uh, uh, please uh, don't hesitate uh, to, 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 to speak about these. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mokdad. Uh, guest speakers, if you have any answer to the question of uh, Dr. Mokdad, you can answer. Any one of you. And uh, uh, attendees, please, if you have any further questions, you can type in, you can type it in the chat or raise hand. Uh, pardon. Yes, Dr. Rita. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, both of them was uh, very really the important ones. You know, for a student engagement during uh, the design of courses, it's a fact in medical education. And when it comes uh, to the time that we are all shocked and we are going to have new experiences, uh, it it is more critical to ask about their opinion, their facilities. I give you an example here in Iran. Uh, we have a national LMS here, and uh, when it comes to faculty members, they complain that they need more, uh, you know, file size permitted to be uploaded in the LMS, both for uh, clinical faculty members and basic sciences, both of them. They all complain that we need uh, to upload larger files, right? But when it comes to the students that were the, at their own home uh, and they should pay for, uh, you know, internet or they are in remote areas that maybe they have some uh, difficulties regarding the access to, uh, to internet, they complain uh, on the other side and they ask professors to chunk their uh, you know, presentations and videos. So I, I suppose that asking the students and involving them is a critical issue uh, in every aspect. Uh, and for even for peer learning in routine face-to-face -face clinical setting, we have, um, I, I know that most universities have some kind of mentorship pro programs that uh, students support each other, especially the, the newcomers to the university. I suppose that these mentorship programs should be changed to somehow e-mentorship programs uh, so that they help each, each, other, each other in teaching and learning and overcoming challenges. And for the next question about uh, graduates, Yes, I suppose that uh, continuous professional development rules, regulations, strategies, delivery methods should all be, uh, you know, somehow affected by this situation and we should uh, rethink of them. For example, in Iran, they, had, they were so quick to develop, a, a, you know, a document that guides universities and um, CPD, Continuous Professional Development Providers, uh, to new approaches of uh, strategies to, um, you know, uh, train graduates of uh, biomedical sciences. Uh, and in this regard, I suppose that it is really, you know, uh, critical to think for post-corona time and for the students that have experienced a part of the education during corona time. We have a students that, for example, they are in the last one or two years of the two year of their uh, education and they are graduating in corona time. Maybe for these students after COVID-19, we should uh, think special strategies uh, to be sure that they have reached the minimum requirements, especially for the uh, semester that we lost. Uh, and I'm talking of the previous semester that uh, maybe in some aspects it was somehow lost, uh, you know, and it was not as a, a systematic approach or design to, uh, for delivering the courses or requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rita, for this explanation, uh, for uh, your answer. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I think we uh, reach to the end of our webinar today. That's Dr. all. Taylor, sorry. Yes. Sorry, Dr. Taylor. The Chancellor of Basra University wants to add some comment. Okay. Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. Thank you very much, Dr. Murtaba. I want to ask our guest from Iran and Dr. Isabel if you have any rules now to guide or the same rules which you use for the face-to-face -face teaching to have something about the absentees of the students or cheating or dismissing from the classes, any rules you have for uh, e-learning or it is the same which is used for face-to-face -face learning, please. The, the one thing I'm, I would like to, to answer in that respect is that 
when we have students online, um, so when they are actually um, interacting with us remotely, we are insisting that they turn on their cameras um, and participate in the class. Participation is very important. It's, it's as you know, learning is not passive, it has to be active. So them sitting back behind the camera with the camera switched off, not interacting as we are doing now is frankly not very useful. So, so that is one feature that we've, we've insisted on and it seems to be working. Obviously we don't need the camera on the whole time, but if, if it's in a small group session, we have 20, 25 students, I, I need to be able to see them uh, just as they need to be able to see me. Apart from anything else, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to speak to a blank screen. You know, those of us who are used to teaching, um, we have real people behind that, in front of us and, and we are used to seeing their, their expressions, we're, we're used to seeing them interact with us. Talking to a blank screen is terrible, as you know. So other than that, no, um, uh, we haven't changed any, any rules, of course, apart from the, the cheating rules, but that is, that's another story. I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Isabel, for uh, your answer. And uh, the table, please. Yes, yes, doctor. Professor Saad, Fadal. Naam, doctor Saad, Hadartak, and the Mudakal, doctor. يعني حتى نختم من بعد إذن حضرتك دكتور إذا ما يعني إذا لا يوجد أي مداخلات ممكن نختم أساتذتنا الأعزاء من بعد إذن حضراتكم دكتور كتيبة دكتور كتيبة إذا دقيقة طيني إذا عدت نعم نعم تفضل دكتور حسين ما جاء أسمع الصراحة السيد رئيس الجامعة الصوت غير واصل ما جاء وصلنا صوت حضرتك دكتور سعد أسمعك أسمعك نعم دكتور نعم إذا انتهت بعد نشكر الجماعة الإخوان We thank our guests نعم uh, We are happy to have them with our meeting and we learn a lot from their experience Thank you and thankful uh, and thank you for everyone who have attending this meeting and we hope that we will meet in the next uh, sessions and we will change our, our uh, learning to blended learning instead of electronic learning. Thank you very much, Dr. Khotay. Dr. Saad, if you have a minute, we will be Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Saad Shaheen Hamadi, the Chancellor of Basra University. Thanks for, your, thanks for joining us, and thanks for your questions and uh, for your presence with us. Uh, the last question for uh, Dr. Hsien, and then we will uh, Thank you. close the webinar. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Khotay. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, tell very important things rise from Dr. Isabel for Dr. Saad and for our university. Uh, Dr. Isabel said we need to decide which part of curriculum we will use as a teaching, which we need to use as a prepared learning, and which we will use as a practice with the minimum camp uh, visitor. So uh, this is very important. We need to start now to talk with our college to put a, uh, a schedule for this in a detail, which part we need to use it as a learning, which part we need to use it as a pair parent interaction, and which part we need to use it as a practical, not just a, a, a main title. We need to put this in a detailed schedule, and this is very important, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hsien. Uh, finally, uh, right, that's all about webinar today. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, our guest speakers, uh, Professor Isabel from Malta and uh, Dr. Rita Mujtabazada from Iran and Dr. Uh, Ayn Mohammadi from Iran. And thanks for uh, Dr. Murtaz Al Musafir and Dr. Jawad Al Khorasani. Thanks for all for your efforts, for nice presentations, for good information, and uh, many thanks for uh, our attendees. Uh, and th and uh, we, I hope uh, we will uh, meet again in the future uh, in uh, a more hot topics about the e-learning and blended learning. And uh, thank you. Uh, see you. And goodbye.
في امان الله جميعا حضور الكرام شكرا جزيلا لحضراتكم شكرا للسيد رئيس الجامعه لحضوره معنا طيله فتره المؤتمر في امان الله شكرا ثانك يو دكتور Thank you, Thank you all. You. It was wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you all. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Allah is pleased, Doctor. Thank you very much for your presence. We are busy. You 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 are busy. شكرا جزيلا What? دكتور لحضرتك دكتوره هنا دكتوره هنا كذلك شكرا جزيلا دكتوره هنا الحاضره دائما في كل الاحداث جزيلا. الله يحفظكم جميعا في امان الله شكرا جزيلا دكتور قتيبه الله يحفظك مع السلامه مع السلامه